Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. Um, delighted to welcome you to this, the third Tribal Elder Lecture in our series, which began with Dr. Jane Goodall last April, just about this time, followed by Professor Aubrey Manning, who we're delighted to have in the audience this evening. Thank you for coming, Aubrey. Um, I would now like to introduce you to our Chief Executive, Chris West, who will introduce our very special speaker of the evening, known to many of you and truly a tribal elder of our own. So, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me at the back? Yes. Good. Kathy's given me an impossible challenge. She said that I've got a minute to introduce Professor Roger Wheater, OBE, a whole string of other letters, FRSE. And a minute is nothing like enough to give due credit to somebody whose life has been so rich and so varied and who has made such a contribution to not just the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, but so many other organizations and people. This is his CV, so you appreciate that there's a challenge to distilling it down. Just a few points from it, though. He's going to talk to us, and the talk is entitled From Elephants to Penguins, and thank, I feel a bit like Eamon Andrews, like I should have a red book <laughs> and be waving it. I can't do the accent, so you'll spare that. Um, from elephants to penguins. So, of course, some of the journey starts in Uganda, where Roger was from 1956 to 1972, and he ended up as the director of Uganda National Parks. And then he came from working with animals in the wild to animals in a city zoo in Edinburgh. And he spent the following 26 years as the director, CEO of the RZSS. 26 years is an extraordinary length of service and contribution. And he was only the second person from within the RZSS to be awarded the Fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh during that period, and also an OBE. So, what can I say about Roger? Because I'm sure I've tipped over that minute by now. What I can say is that he continues to make a contribution. He's on the board. So, the Roger that I first met, I can't remember exactly when, but it's at least 15 years ago, and he hasn't changed. <laughs> it's still a person who has wisdom, shrewdness, a great memory, lots of advice, but also a twinkle, an ability to enjoy and be easy with other people. So, Roger has been an inspiration and a role model, not just to me, but to many, many other people who are now in leadership positions in zoos and in conservation across the world. He's also been a pioneer, somebody who thinks out of the box and makes things happen. So, the British and the European and the world so associations have all been led by Roger and he has made them achieve great things. I think if there's one, perhaps one legacy, one thing that he would feel very proud about as a pioneer, and that would be education. And I certainly spend quite a lot of my time thinking, how can we get back to the sort of leadership position and high reputation we enjoyed when Roger was in charge. No pressure on me. Huh? So, thank you, Roger, for being that advisor and mentor. 
I'm going to finish now by just paraphrasing a quote that's often attributed to Isaac Newton. And that's saying essentially that whatever we achieve now, it's because we're standing on the shoulder of giants, or a giant. And that's Roger. So come and tell us about your life. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, after an introduction like that, I think I should probably say thank you so much and good night. <laughs> but, but I'm not going to. Um, but, but thank you very much indeed for, for those very kind words. And before I start, perhaps I could also thank um, Cathy Sawley and um, John Paul Orsi, who helped me as, a, a, as totally incapable on things like PowerPoint. And I hope I'm not going to prove that tonight. Um, uh, and two volunteers, Moira Moyes and Barbara Wilson, both of whom did work on scanning the, some of the slides that you're going to see uh, tonight. I'd like to begin where Aubrey Manning left off last year. He brilliantly set out the dangers of human overpopulation to both man and other species. The wildlife conservation movement recognised many years ago that it had to act to protect species in the wild and certainly could not wait a resolution to the challenge of an ever-growing human population. In fact, the pressure on areas protected for species conservation are often indicators to the negative impact of the continued growth of our own species. So although the title of my talk this evening illustrates my move from Uganda to Edinburgh, my intention this evening is to give you some insight into the development of what I've called the zoo's building blocks for conservation. Although I will talk mostly about the zoo and zoos, I wish to share for just a few minutes a small but important aspect of my work in Uganda. I was Chief Warden of Merchant Falls National Park uh, for 10 years, but for the purposes of tonight's talk, I want to say just a few words about just three species that lived in that 1,500 square mile national park. In 1960, when I joined national parks, the population of the northern race of the white rhino was estimated at 5,000 in the southern Sudan, eastern Congo, and western Uganda. In that decade, 15 animals were translocated from northwestern Uganda where they were under increased pressure from human development, into the sanctuary of the park. They flourished with 32 animals living there by 1972. I inherited a six-month-old female rhino and brought her up until she was adult when she was released. Uh, this, that's, that's this picture here. Um, and this is just to prove that I did have some hands-on animal experience before, <laughs> before I actually came to the zoo. She was released when she became adult. There's a long story, almost as, as long as this evening's lecture, about this animal. Uh, she was released, had a calf of her own in the wild, and then sadly was killed by poachers from the Congo. In the intervening years, all the northern race of the white rhinoceros have been killed in the wild, including those in the Merchant Falls National Park. As of today, the world population is just, just about the same as that bottom left-hand image, the total world population. Elderly animals that were in a Czech zoo until they were moved in 2009 to the Old Pogeta Conservancy in Kenya with their numbers down to three, there is little hope of breeding a subspecies that is truly on the edge of imminent extinction. Our local efforts proving unsustainable in a Uganda that fell into anarchy under Idi Amin. We had 14,000 hippo in the permanent waters of the Nile and Lake Albert. Numbers had built up over many years, and this was because the hippo's most serious predator man had been removed from the, from, the, from the area of the National Park. Man and hippo 
have a common need for permanent water and therefore in some areas lived alongside each other. And man had hunted hippo with trap and spear for thousands of years. Hippo have a limited range of about four miles from permanent water, although as their habitat becomes degraded, they will move further and further away in search of grazing. And as a result, becoming underfed, weaker and more susceptible to, susceptible to disease. Because of increased numbers, their grazing habitat had become denuded. Sheet erosion had taken place and grass species changed to the disbenefit not only of the hippo, uh, but from other species as well. So the park population was reduced by 4,000 through a scientifically targeted cull following considerable research in our sister park of the Queen Elizabeth. We had been warned of possible consequences of overpopulation through the experience of Park Albert in the Congo, where about 85% of the hippo population had been wiped out by anthrax as they fell into a weakened state as a result of habitat degradation. We had 14,000 elephant way above the carrying capacity of the park. Not a biological explosion, but change of land use by humans in the large areas adjacent to the park, turning elephant habitat into agricultural use. Thus displacing thousands of elephants into the sanctuary uh, of the National Park. This is a, a photograph taken from the, the plane that I used to fly in Uganda. There are over 600 elephants in that photograph. They're like the, the sort of Israelites wandering in the desert looking for somewhere uh, that was secure. And that, that was the problem uh, that, we, that we faced. Such an increase had taken place over many years. And vast areas of woodland were reduced to grassland and mature trees destroyed and the regeneration of woody vegetation was, was, was prevented. Now, this picture, difficult to get any idea of scale here, but you're looking at about, about 15 miles of river there. And all that land on, on both sides, it would formerly woodland many, many years ago, had turned into open grassland uh, as a result of the attention of the elephant. We know that this was woodland quite recently because the termite mine, mounds that are in, in, in the grass here are the termite mounds of a woodland species, not of a grassland species. So in recent time, that had changed uh, from woodland uh, to grassland. Now you'll quite easily understand that the impact of this change uh, was great on animals like giraffe and so on that relied on trees, but interestingly enough, it was also, it also impacted on elephants themselves because browse was part of their, of their, should have been part of their diet. This is a lilac breasted roller, one of the many woodland birds that were affected by the lack, the lack and the loss of, of woodland. With such changes, although you lose some, you win some as well, and this increased grassland meant that the 32,000 buffalo that lived in the park um, did so rather successfully. A reduction through culling of 2,000 elephant was instigated and the impact of such reduction was to be monitored to assess whether enough was enough. The monitoring never took place because one Idi Amin took over in Uganda, anarchy prevailed and his soldiers and other, others killed 10,000 of the elephant in Merchant Falls National Park. And when I visited Uganda in 1980, following the removal of Idi Amin, I saw more elephant bones than living animals. When I visited Uganda in 2006, the vast grassy plains had been replaced by woodland. A woodland that had been there in the 1920s, changed to, under the impact of elephant to grassland, and now with no elephant or few, very, very many fewer elephant, back uh, to woodland again. Winston Churchill <coughs> stood on a hill in, in the National Park in 1924 
and described the country in front of him. And he described it as a land of trees and grassy glades and went on, of course, in typical Churchillian fashion to say, in which whole squadrons of troopers could be hidden without a gleam on a bayonet or a lance. Um, <laughs> which sort of gave you some idea that it was pretty woody uh, at that time. This, have, this, of course, has been a very brief introduction to some of my work in the park. However, there are a number of key messages here that I would like you to hold. Firstly, that even the largest of reserves are islands in a sea of human activity. That despite our efforts, the northern white rhino is now absent in the wild and not viable in captivity. That in order to maintain diversity of species, management has to be applied where species have, for whatever reason, impacted adversely on its own environment and that of other species. Sadly, that management is sometimes lethal. And finally, political regime change can have a dramatic impact on a nation's conservation efforts. Now, in 1972, I came out of the wild and into captivity. Edinburgh Zoo had a, a very good reputation as a zoological collection, although it was still the era when a zoo's importance was measured by how many species there were in the collection, and in some cases, how rare they were. In 1972, for instance, there were 270 species of mammals and birds in the collection here in Edinburgh, 100 of which were, were, were represented by a single, a single animal. Many of the enclosures lacked vegetation, and even the new monkey house was a mixture of tiles and stainless steel, and this was due to a perception that health problems were avoided by having a constantly clean environment. Difficult for animals that spent their days scent marking um, bits of their enclosure. In a sense, I suppose, the efficacy of veterinary medicine had really caught up with cage design. Although some animals were kept in appropriate family groups, this was not always the case. Indeed, there were either not enough animals to form important social groups, or if they were, uh, they were not kept together. The chimpanzees were a very bad example of this. At the time of my appointment, I made two requests. Firstly, that in the event that I was invited to return to Uganda on a mission basis, that I would be able to consider doing so. And secondly, that I would be encouraged to bring to council and the executive committee, as soon as possible, my thoughts on the way forward for the organization. A few months later, I presented two papers proposing the development of an action orientated agenda for the society, and these were approved by council. They included quite a number of issues of governance of the society, but importantly, a widening of the organization's activities, including the development of new and closer links with other conservation organizations in Scotland. Scottish Wildlife Trust, National Trust for Scotland, RSPB, Scottish Natural Heritage, the uh, Royal Botanic Gardens, and so on. And be, to be prepared to promote and assist the work of these organizations. One of the other um, areas of activity that the Council wished me to pursue uh, was the develop, to develop and contribute to the national and international organisations. In those days, the International Union of Zoological Directors and the British Zoo Federation, <coughs> now known as WAZA, the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria, and the AZA, the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria. Also, to develop closer links with Scotland's universities, our main link at this time was with the University of Edinburgh's Dick Vecht, who provided a most wonderful veterinary service uh, to Edinburgh Zoo. To quickly develop the zoo's new education program. The need for wider professional advice was identified, leading to the appointment of two advisory committees with the membership that included experts from out with the council, or indeed the membership. The Animal Health and Management Advisory Committee and the Education and Conservation Advisory Committee were initiated and were under my chairmanship. With these arrangements in place, 
they formed the secure foundations upon which the building blocks of conservation could be built. I must make it clear at this point that my involvement in much of the future development was only possible because of the direction, support and encouragement of the Council and Executive Committee and more, most importantly the considerable ability of the senior management team and those that they led. They not only worked well together but could be left in confident expectation that they would continue their work in the absence of the director. This proved to be the case and the influence of RZSS increased the contribution made by senior managers was considerable and in particular I would mention Dr. Miranda Stevenson, Curator of Animals and Rob Olson, Head of Education. I must also thank someone without whom all my activities for the Society, both within the collection and in various parts of the world, would have been immeasurably more difficult but for my wife Jeannie, who ensured that the stresses and strains of a busy life in Africa and an even busier life in Scotland from becoming overburdensome and kept me more or less sane. Well, I think, <laughs> I, I, I think more or less sane. <laughs> I'm going to look at the building blocks separately for convenience, but of course they are connected both in their application and over time. I must apologise in advance that time does not allow me to go into very much of the detail of the content of each of the blocks. I suspect that most of them would individually justify a lecture on their own. We recognise that the three principal conservation activities were breeding of endangered species in captivity, support conservation activities in the wild and develop a, a, an education program of learning activities for young and for old. Starting with the first of these, breeding endangered species in captivity is an easy concept to agree, but with a wide range of requirements, some of them complex, to make it work. We have to be able to keep our animals properly and by this I mean not just in good health, but in an environment that enables them to use their natural behavioural repertoires as much as is feasible in the captive situation. One very obvious example of failure to recognise the importance of social group was the chimpanzees. The most serious issue was that the animals housed in the old chimp house were kept two by two in sterile surroundings, socialising visually and vocally but through the bars without contact. Then there was the question of the chimps' tea party. Young chimps were only available from the wild and their acquisition almost always meant the death of the adults during capture. So the practice was stopped, but rather perversely, the young chimps had a more, more social and other interaction than the adults themselves in their rather sterile cages. A zoology student, Charles Watson, I think probably one of Aubrey Manning's uh, students, proposed as his first year, uh, final year study an experimental enrichment of the chimpanzee environment. Animals were given toys, telephone books, clothing, greatly increasing their activity, but annoying some of our members who complained that the place looked like a rubbish tip. <laughs> well, it did look like a rubbish tip. <laughs> but the important thing is that the chimps were much, much, much more active even in these still two-by-two two situations. And interesting enough, the visitors to the zoo spent more time looking at the chimps uh, than they, they had done hitherto And so it was, it was a win-win situation in that sense. It was, however, recognised that the most important need was for, the, for the chimps was to bring them all together. And the following year, that was 1974, Charles Watson was employed to integrate our 11 animals. Later we were able to develop a larger outside enclosure and the old external cages were removed and used as climbing frames. Also included was an artificial termite mound. The outcome was a happy group of chimpanzees and a number of births. Such improvements continued with the development of Bodongo. The recent decision to close the rock dens is indicative of this continual process of assessing what is suitable in, in, for the animals for which we are responsible. One of the unintended consequences 
the redevelopment of the chimp house was that three of them escaped. <laughs> and, and for some reasons I'm not entirely clear, one of them took a fancy to me. <laughs> and so in the process of trying to catch them up, I said to the keepers, don't worry, let me, let me go in through, into, the, into the chimp house and you slam the door behind me once we both get in. I, having worked out a, pl a, a cunning plan, that I would go into one cage and the chimp would go into the other. Uh, you can imagine what happened. We both ended up, <laughs> we both ended up in the same cage. Uh, and if you want to see a zoo director in a, in a, in a, a, a submissive, submissive <laughs> mode, that was surely me on that, on that occasion. Uh, fortunately, Ricky, I, I think it was Ricky. Was it Ricky? Ricky, Ricky um, kept banging on the, on, the, on the cages, but coming back to me for comfort, which consisted of tickling the top of his head with my eyes downcast. <laughs> Another development was the Keeper Training Programme. My first question to the Zoo Federation was what were their thoughts on the development of a standard approach to Keeper Training. I was told that only London had a programme at Paddington Tech and the development of such a, a wider programme was not on their list of priorities. However, keepers from Edinburgh Zoo and Glasgow Zoo, and Douglas Richardson, of course, who's now at the Highland Wildlife Park, was one of these pioneers, started constructive talks with the University of Glasgow on developing such a programme. I was able to return to the Federation, making the point that it would be a nonsense for such a programme to, to be developed only in Scotland. And so, with input from many zoos, the Keeper City and Guilds training programme was developed and launched by the National Extension College, Cambridge. All new keepers in Edinburgh are required to take the course and existing keepers encouraged to do so. This programme now has diploma status. The impact of such programmes has meant that many keepers are now engaged in administering important national, regional and international stud books, species survival programmes, taxon, taxon advisory groups and other programmes essential to the success of breeding in captivity. I believe that this change in emphasis on training greatly helped the creation of ABWAC, the Association of British Wild Animal Keepers, in 1974. I understand that currently eight keepers are involved in the, in the activities involved in the, very <coughs> excuse me, the various conservation groups. Returning to the chimps uh, for just a moment, as a result of the, of, the, uh, of the change in bringing them together, eight chimp babies were born. And we had all sorts of complications with those, but I won't go into it. But it did lead to a slightly embarrassing situation where I was speaking at a girls' school in Edinburgh on their prize day. Uh, and of course, I presume they wanted me to talk about animals. And as the chimpanzees and the young chimps were very much on my mind at that time, I perhaps unwisely likened the behaviour of the young chimps uh, to the younger children in the, in the school. Uh, the, the teachers nodded uh, in, in, in approval the children thought it was very amusing, uh, and the parents were absolutely furious. <laughs> <laughs> and I was never, never invited back. <laughs> and, and, and to finish the story, I was walking down Princess Street one day, and a lady coming towards me suddenly recognised me, and she came and she said, you're the man that said my daughter was like a chimpanzee. <laughs> and she said, as she passed, and you were quite right. <laughs> However, um, returning to the relevance of this, pic of this um, uh, picture. At a meeting of zoo directors held in Edinburgh, here in Edinburgh Zoo in 1975 on the conservation of apes, it was agreed that operating breeding programs in isolation was at best of short-term benefit and it was decided that we must organise such programs on at least a national level. We decided therefore to persuade those zoos that held great apes in their collections to come together to cooperate in the development of a planned and co cooperative program, breeding program to ensure that within our captive population we had as broad a genetic base as possible to avoid, in other words, inbreeding. <clears throat> My friend and colleague Jeremy Mallinson at Jersey Zoo, who was much involved in the concept, was responsible for gathering support for gorillas, Molly Badham at Twycross Zoo for chimps, and Geoffrey Greed of Bristol uh, for orangutans. 
Thus was born the Anthropoid Ape Advisory Panel, which I chaired for some 13 years until we handed it over to Biaza, who by then were coordinating a wide range of conservation breeding groups. All the owners of the apes, apart from John Aspinall Zoo at Howlitz, agreed to place their animals under joint management. The book value of animals was taken off zoo balance sheets and a charge was agreed for each animal in our collections. This allowed the Anthropoid Ape Advisory Panel to appoint a scientific officer to develop the population models for each species on the basis of the known provenance. We were fortunate enough to appoint a young zoology graduate called Georgina Mace, now Professor Georgina Mace, CBE, FRS, Professor of Biodiversity and Ecosystems at the University College London. This kind of collaboration was not, of course, unique, for collaboration over the Arabian oryx had taken place some years previously. This is a picture of Caroline, the only oryx in the United Kingdom. She was at London Zoo. She was sent to join the world herd in San Diego and produce 16 calves during her time there. The world herd was eventually split between San Diego and Phoenix, Arizona, before animals were sent to Amman uh, for release. I saw these animals in the Sultan's collection at Seeb near Muscat when Jeremy Mallinson and I visited to advise on the collection. Part of the agreement was, uh, for such a visit was that we should be taken to see the animals in the wild. We were helicoptered down to the Yaluni Desert and one of my magic conservation moments was to see this group of animals in the wild, animals the adults of which had been captive bred. This success was the result of one or two like-thinking zoos getting together to take forward a plan that was to make a huge difference to the future of this species. The Fauna and Flora Preservation Society caught up the last few animals remaining in the wild and bringing them together with captive animals from the Middle East private collections and from zoological parks worldwide. In the 1960s, the only major zoo donors to conservation work in the field, other than some research activity, were the New York Zoological Society and the Frankfurt Zoological Society. The plane that I flew in Uganda, and, and that was so important to my work, was actually provided by the New York Zoological Society. This society's <coughs> first modest contribution was a small grant to allow Dr. Bill McGrew to visit Gombe Stream in, in Tanzania to look at the work of our first tribal elder, uh, Jane Goodall. In the recent past, and since my retirement, nearly 16 years ago now, I've been delighted to see the support given to chimpanzee research and conservation in the Bodongo Forest of Uganda. That was an area adjoining the Merchant Falls National Park, and I knew the forest quite well. I work in South America with giant armadillo and other species, including six and nine banded armadillo, giant and lesser anteaters, is another sign of the involvement that we have out beyond our gates. The arrival and recent activity involving uh, China was the presence in the zoo of Tian Tian and Yang Wang, and particularly pleased, I'm particularly pleased that 90% of the funding that goes to China, it goes into mainline cons conservation, and more recently, we have actually been told where that money is actually going, and this is very satisfactory indeed. Closer to home, there has been joint activity with the Scottish Wildlife Trust into only, not only assisting at Napdale trial, where the first trial for beavers was has taken place, but also providing genetic expertise in respect of the illegal Tayside beavers, and most importantly, setting out the management options for beavers if the Scottish Government decide in May that beavers will be a feature of Scotland's countryside. Uh, looking at the immediate future, the work that we will be undertaking <coughs> on improving the genetic status and presence of our native wildcat. Already our genetics team have been involved and Highland Wildlife Park is gearing up for breeding this species for future release. So the commitment to direct involvement with conservation in the field moves forward apace. 
Such developments in the wider zoo community has meant that even the smaller collections have been engaged in projects with their local wildlife trusts. Just today, just this very day, I got a, an email from Biaza announcing a partnership with the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts with a program called Wildlife at Home, which is to encourage even greater uh, engagement between the zoological collections and the work in the wild itself. This is maybe a good point to comment on the role of the various zoo organisations. The Federation of Zoological Gardens, now called Biaza, was set up in the 1960s and they developed standards of animal keeping that were to be followed by its members who were inspected to ensure that they were conforming. This was an era of some bad zoos and sadly uh, these were the very ones that did not join the Federation. This led us to lobbying for legislation and I was appointed chair of the group that developed the standards for inclusion in the, in the Zoo Licensing Act of 1981. This included the appointment of zoo inspectors from within the zoo community and to ensure that standards were being met. The process of inspection continues to this day. Much of the content of the UK Act found its way into European legislation, although there was an additional and very important addition that required zoos to show evidence of conservation activity. The European Association of Zoos was first made up of zoo membership within Europe and to some extent mirrored the development of the British Federation. I was involved in various aspects of its development and followed Fred Dam Daman as chairman. This at a time when the Berlin Wall came down and there was a real drive to include and support uh, zoos from the Eastern Bloc, <coughs> many of whom became members. The IUDZG, the International Union of Directors of Zoological Gardens, was a relatively small organisation with worldwide representation of about 140 zoos. A bit of a club, really. It was directors who were appointed to membership, not institutions. In 1970, Colin Rawlins of the Zoological Society of London suggested that IUDZG was not fit for purpose and this was not taken any more seriously than my own memo on the subject in 1987. However, in 1990, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources declared that IUDG did not represent the world zoo community and that we were to be downgraded to a national organisation. It, it so happened that I, I, I met in Uganda the Secretary General of IUCN, a man called Talbot, I think, at that time, and persuaded him to hold his horses. And more or less at the same time, zoos in South America were complaining that they were underrepresented in any of the in the in the, in the so-called world body. In 1991 major constitutional change based, I have to say, on my earlier memo, um, of the 27 changes, of which 27 changes were proposed to the membership. All but one were passed unanimously, and the one that failed was the changing of the name IUDZG, how we get hung up sometimes on names. Changes included membership of institutions, membership of commercial zoos, providing they met with the union standards, and most importantly, that the CEOs of national and regional organisations such as our own BIAZA and the European EASA, etc., importantly, uh, were, were in fact represented. Importantly, IUCN were now happy to recognise BIAZA and the name change was agreed at a later meeting. The importance of all these organisations cannot be underestimated as it allowed a huge range of issues and responsibilities to be discussed, some of which I am bringing to your attention tonight, to be debated, encouraged and implemented within its membership and the cooperative opportunities that existed within uh, such a membership. 
you may be interested to know that, that we have gone from 140 zoos that were, were, were represented within the World Zoo body uh, to 1,300 collections that now have a direct involvement with, with Waza. One early and important contribution was the development of the World Zoo Conservation Strategy. It's been, I think, changed three times, twice anyway, since then. The importance of this was recognised following the publication of the Botanic Gardens World Conservation Strategy that came into my hand from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh. The proposal to develop and publish such a strategy was agreed by WASA and I was asked to chair the working group that put the report together. Once again, there was important input to the strategy from zoos across the world and in Edinburgh's case particularly from Miranda Stevenson. The, um, these are Scimitar Horn Doricks up on Castorfin Hill um, and part of, part of the WASA uh, program was to approve stud books and cooperative programs. These animals on Castorfin Hill were part of a European program to return animals to the Buhedma National Park uh, in Tunisia. In my interview for my job in Edinburgh, I asked about the Society's view on education and was delighted to be informed that an education officer was soon to be appointed. The use of the zoo for education had gone on in an informal way for many years. My predecessor, Gilbert Fisher, set up a club, the Gannett Club, for young people. Also, his broadcasts as BBC Hutman had been well received. However, most school visits were in the nature of a day out, what I used to call a bun fight. The first formal education programme had been set up in 1961 by Paynton Zoo to be followed soon after by London. We were to be the third major UK collection to go down this route. We recognised that animal collections provided a very special resource, not only to teach children aspects of zoology, but to develop their awareness of the conservation and environmental issues that faced us both locally and more widely. For very young children, and it turned out for the not so very young as well, handling of animals proved to be a most excellent introduction to the living world. We were able to develop programs for special needs, in this instance uh, a blind um, uh, pupil, but it often included uh, profoundly um, disadvantaged youngsters and seeing them the way they reacted to the handling of animals was, was something very special indeed. Although many of the pupils who came to us were from primary school uh, we were, and we geared our many projects to the needs of the, five, the then 5 to 14 curriculum, we did have a significant number of secondary school schools and with these the wider and more complex conservation issues were understandable. We developed a program called Interlink where we provided projects between organisations like the Scottish Wildlife Trust, the SSPCA and in this image the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh. In this particular interlinking program people, pupils would go to the gardens and get a feel for the tropical forest and be introduced to diverse vegetation of such places. Then they would come to the zoo and see some of the creatures of the forest, like the tiger, which I suspect it would have upset the Regus keeper if there had been any attempt to introduce this species into his hothouse. So it was a compromise, but, but at least um, young, youngsters were able to see a, a variety of activities in a variety of locations. We also provided opportunity for students uh, sitting, uh, sitting certificates of sixth year studies and the Lothian adult education classes and the University of Edinburgh's extramural studies program. The teaching bus with its professional teaching team is a new and welcome addition to the society's ability to extend the message well beyond the collection gates and that further thought is being given to the redevelopment of, of interlinking programs. We tried to engage with, with adults, uh, I have to say <laughs> we weren't very successful in terms of animal handling until we actually brought the adults and the children together. And under those circumstances, the 
the uh, children who, when they came with their, with their primary school or their, or, their, or their infant class, would interact with each other. But when adults were involved, it was a constant turning back uh, to mother or the minders or whoever the adults were. And of course, they got drawn in. And I used to always try and sit in on any new program. And on this particular program, I said to a young mother, well, how did you think that went? And she said, absolutely marvellous, she said. Just wonderful. I never thought I'd hold a snake. I never thought I'd touch a rat. Wonderful, wonderful pro Oh, and the children enjoyed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew, I knew that we'd succeeded in, in, in getting the adults um, together. Now, this was a strange one because I had a... We even put a, a programme on for troops going to Belize. Uh, Rob Olison was incredulous when I told him that 100 jocks were coming for animal handling classes. They enjoyed, they did enjoy this introduction to creatures that they might meet in the jungles of Belize. And uh, it was interesting, these hard, hard soldiers behaving not dissimilarly to the youngsters who got so much fun out of it. The uh, notice boards in the zoo uh, were part of the education department's graphic team and they were responsible for boards, project sheets, newsletters and other reports for photographic library, indeed anything that involved graphic design. On the month before my retirement, we had our one millionth pupil engaged in project-related sessions. This included attendance at our popular summer school. All this activity was made possible by Rob Ollison, head of education, with his team of teachers and his team of volunteers. And the volunteer program was started after I had had a fascinating six-week tour of North America. I was given the 1975 William Thine Scholarship and allowed me to do that. It was the English-speaking union scholarship. And in most major zoos, I met up with docents, and docents are the equivalent of volunteers. And I was able to get an insight into the important people engagement that they had developed. I was told by some of my colleagues in this country that, that, that it would not work. However, notwithstanding, we persevered and we soon had over 100 volunteers undertaking sterling work at Edinburgh Zoo and at the Highland Wildlife Park. And their important contribution to face-to-face -face engagement with our visitors and other activities continues. <coughs> Currently, there are 100, I understand there are 190 volunteers working here in the zoo or in the Highland Wildlife Park. In addition, uh, senior members of staff, myself included, gave talks uh, out, out with the zoo to a whole vast range of groups. I think I gave over, well, I know I gave over 700 talks in my time when I was director. The two cities I put on there is Edinburgh, obviously on the, on the right, and the other one is Calgary. Calgary was the furthest I ever went to give a lecture um, for the Calgary Zoological Society. But these lectures were important because it, it allowed uh, us to tell the public about the work of the modern zoo. And then we were able to put considerable emphasis on our conservation work and aspirations. The diversity and scope of the society's education program became well known internationally, and in particular through the International zoo Association of Zoo Educators, of which Rob Ollison became its president. The curator was in charge of a program to encourage students to use the collection for non-invasive research. And this proved so popular with universities in Scotland and beyond that we had to employ someone to coordinate. And Dr. Robert Young was our coordinator for some time <clears throat> to look after the increasing number of students. I recall in our busiest year, we had 38 students undertaking um, various bits of research within the zoological gardens. This included um, visits from second year vet students from universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow and by postgraduates from the Centre for Tropical Veterinary Medicine, to whom I gave an annual lecture on the utilisation of animals in the wild <coughs> and the activities of population management and conservation. 
We engaged with Stirling University in the hope that we might develop a centre where the visiting public could observe the work of the researchers. Although this never happened, I was delighted some years after my retirement to learn of the engagement with the University of St Andrews and others in the development of living links. I know that of necessity this has been a series of thumbnail sketches of the conservation work developed, improved and maintained by our society and its influence beyond the zoo gates. I believe that though in world terms a relatively small collection, we have more than played our part in the development of many of the activities of the organisations that I have spoken of tonight. Let me quickly remind you of what I believe are the essential building blocks for conservation. Collections that provide best possible welfare and environment for our animals. Standards for the keeping of animals that are set in law but subject to continual improvement. Keepers who are well trained and experienced. Cooperative and coordinated breeding programs that are international in their scope that draw on animal resources and expertise. Research that increases our knowledge upon which to base management decisions. Support and engagement in conserving species in the wild. National and regional organisations that represent the interests of all responsible zoos and promote best practice and coordinate important <laughs> conservation activities. Programmes of education and learning for young and old to increase their understanding of conservation issues both locally and more globally. I'm so pleased that in the 16 years plus since my retirement, the building blocks that I have described have been improved and reshaped to fulfil a real desire and indeed I believe an obligation on the part of zoological collections to help ensure the future of many species that are at risk. We continue to have a most attractive collection here in Edinburgh. Not all the species we hold are at this time endangered, but they do give our visitors a lot of pleasure. And these animals are, if you like, the ambassadors that make the zoo popular. And our popularity is important, not only because it finances all our activities, but also because it gives us the opportunity to draw to and engage with our visitors and bring to their attention the important issues that face wildlife and wild places. If we can teach them to care for our wild places and wildlife, and if we can teach them that management is an essential part of successful conservation activity, whether in captive collections or in the wild, then and only then will we have a community that truly understands conservation and the issues it faces. If I, allied, if I were allowed to wave a magic wand, the, what I would want to do is to get everybody to understand the fundamental requirement in this overcrowded planet of ours is that we manage in whatever way may be appropriate our oft times fragile heritage of wildlife in wild places. I hope that we can all agree that we need to ensure that the lion can continue to look out over their countryside, that there will still be wildcat on the hills in Scotland, that the elephant will continue to find their way to water in wild places, that wherever the sun sets in this world of ours, that it will do so on places of refuge where native flora and fauna can reign supreme. That is the challenge and I sincerely believe that the zoo world with the support of animal collections and supportive members such as we have here in Edinburgh and the Highland Wildlife Park will continue to play an ever increasing role in helping to ensure that species will be secure in wild places into the future and not the sad, sad memory like the northern race of the white rhinoceros. Thank you very much. Roger, thank you so much for taking us from elephants to penguins and back again. Um, we have time now just for a couple of questions. Um, that means I've overrun. Okay. <laughs> trying to be graceful. <laughs> um, so who would like to begin, please? 
Wow. <laughs> yes, Aubrey. Aubrey. Well, I, I would like to, <clears throat> you started in Uganda. Uh, I would like to ask you about Uganda now and whether you think that the messages you so eloquently put across are getting there and that being run by Ugandans. Yes, they are. When, when I went back in six years ago, I was very keen to meet the head of the Uganda Wildlife Authority. Um, I, had, I had proposed when I went out with the UN that all wildlife should come together under a single entity, uh, under a board of trustees, and that was the one, Uganda Wildlife Authority. So I was very keen to meet them, and I did. And I had a wonderful reception from them. And one of the things that they said, which was totally unnecessary, uh, the, the, head, the chief executive, a man called Moses Mapesa, said, Roger, when you left Uganda, and this was 16 years previously, uh, you left on your desk a justification for 11 new national parks or extensions to existing ones. We have made seven of them. And so that was a heartwarming um, moment. Even more heartwarming was when he, he moved me off. When I said, was saying goodbye to him, he said, no, I've been a surprise for you. Took me into a room, and in that room, round a round table with the 10 chief wardens of the 10 national parks. So, yes, but the, I, I could go on a long time about Uganda. I mean, the, 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 and I won't, because I know I've got to be brief. But the one thing I will say, the one thing I will say about Uganda is that one of the really fundamental changes has been the role of women. And women now are much, much more involved in a whole raft of activities, including non-government organizations and so on. And that has been extraordinarily effective. Uh, I think you've clearly given us all great food for thought. And I would like to now call upon Jeremy P. Archer for the vote of thanks. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm Jeremy P. And it's my great pleasure to deliver an honor, actually, to deliver a vote of thanks to Roger. Uh, but first of all, thank you, Kathy, for organizing this evening and, and the earlier tribal elder folks. This is a great concept, concept and it's been expertly delivered uh, and will continue to be so. Thanks also to those that made this possible, to Joe Poulsen for her role in organizing the evening, to Jonathan Levy for the filming, and Katie Patton for being our photographer. And of course, to all other RZSS staff for all they have done to make tonight such a great success, as well as to all of you coming here. I think there are a couple of seats left, uh, but we probably locked them out because we, we were starting, so thank you all for coming. But my major vote of thanks has to be to our star of the evening, Professor Roger Wheaton. Um, I have to admit that when Roger was first elected to the board of RZSS, uh, I, I didn't know him very well at that stage, and I have some mixed emotions. I was delighted that someone with all of his experience and expertise should be back with us on the board. But at the same time, I had some trepidation as how we mere amateurs and beginners of this would interrelate with the man who to many of us was and remains Mr. RZSS. I should have had no trepidation. Roger has added huge value to the board since he's come back to join us. And he has been the most delightful board member and companion that we could ever wish for. So my first thank you, Roger, is to all that you have done for us in your time, your continuing time on the board of the Society. You've done a fantastic job for us, so thank you. And now that I've heard this talk and learnt a little bit more, there's a lot more to learn about your time as director and your career pre-RZSS. Uh, I can just begin to appreciate how much you have achieved over your long and remarkable career. You've contributed a huge amount to conservation overseas and here. And what you've achieved with Waza and your other work has really changed the face of zoos and the way they're organized and interacted. I learned so much, I appreciated so much of what we do now that has stemmed from what you did during your time here. So the, the achievement is immense. And we must all thank you for that. And we must also thank you for making it come alive for us tonight. We were very fortunate to be here, and I'm thrilled, Cathy, that we will have this on the web so that others can learn, because there's so much to learn. And I would like to look back at some of the things you told us, Roger, 
and to appreciate more. And I can see a real link between what you did and what Chris West is now doing. I think there is a consistency and a continuity. And I think Chris has learned a lot of lessons from you. And I know that he'd be the first to admit that. And I think there's a continuity which is really pleasing that we can try and learn from you. And you use the word education a lot. And you're going to keep on going on with this at the board. <laughs> I know that. And good luck to you. We will listen to you and we will try to do what we can. And it was great that we were able to honour your good friend Robert, the AGM, last year with the Nunnery Fellowship. That was your pressure and it was the right pressure. We're delighted, given what I heard today of how much he has achieved, that we were able to do that. So, perhaps I should now say that we've got a little gift for you. And I'm going to ask our sculpture in residence, Mr. John Ramsey, if he could perhaps come forward with that. I dare pick it up, actually. You can, you can get it out of the bag. This is a little something. Oh, Roger. Oh, look at that. There we go. John and the, the work he does is fantastic and can I now ask you all before I make a few further remarks can you all give a huge thank you to Professor Roger Wita OBE FRC. <laughs> First, I'm delighted to announce that Chris and Kathy have arranged that Lee Durrell will be our tribal elder at this time in 2016. So I'm sure that many, if not all of you, know of Lee and her brilliant work at Jersey and internationally. And she is such a marvellous choice to pick up the baton at that time. So that's great. Uh, but we must ask Roger to hold on to the baton for the moment, uh, because we hope that we will have another tribal elder event in the autumn of this year, but negotiations continue. And my lips are sealed, <laughs> but fingers are, are very firmly crossed. The second point I want to make is, is hot off the press news that Chris gave me today, which is, we talked about the Armadillo Project very briefly there. Well, Arno Desbier, if that's the correct pronunciation, who runs the giant Armadillo Project in the Pantanal, has this very evening been awarded a Whitley Award, a Conservation Oscar, at a ceremony in the Royal Geographical Society in London, with our patron, Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal, will have handed that over, an event hosted by Kate Humble, who recently starred in Lambing Live in West Linton, which I think is her main claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> so, so congratulations from all of us to Arno, and to Sarah, Ian, and all the others who have helped to make that project so phenomenal. And the further good news is that along with the award comes a good dollop of cash <laughs> to support the project going forward. So that's great. And the last point I want to make is that uh, there will be a retiring collection as you go. This will be for the benefit of the Bodongo Field Station, which again Roger referred to, and which obviously you all know about. And I think you all know it's celebrating its 25th anniversary. So if you feel like making a little contribution, we'd be very grateful indeed. But that's it. Thank you all very much for coming. We'll see you certainly next spring and hopefully in the autumn. And meantime, I think Roger deserves another round. Of applause.